Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! You know what I said to you a while ago about that hope in the back of your mind that you're wrong? I've still got it. There's still a little bit of me that thinks, well, maybe they will reopen the withdrawal agreement. And, um... And then you see Andrea Leadsom saying it on state television, on national television. And you, you realise that they've told us a million times that they're not going to reopen the withdrawal agreement. That, why would they suddenly do it now? Their preparations for a no-deal Brexit are way further down the line than ours are. They were never scared of it in the sense that it was a weapon we wielded that would harm them. It was literally us threatening to punt... Well, not literally. It was... And I apologise for this phrase. If you have young children with you, you might want to cover their ears. But this whole business about saying no deal, we need to threaten no deal, was like threatening to punch someone with your own testicles. That is precisely what we have done as a country. And they've gone, well, all right then, have a swing if you want, but it's going to hurt you a lot more than it hurts us, you complete weirdos. And now put your trousers on, you're nicked. The um, latest development is Theresa May flying to Germany to beg Angela Merkel to help her get some sort of Brexit through the House of Commons. That's what taking back control looks like. British Prime Minister, stymied by a sovereign parliament, begging the Chancellor of Germany to help her. It is only three years since we were one of the key players at the top table of Europe. And now, because apparently we were in hock to Germany, in order to no longer be in hock to Germany, our Prime Minister is flying to Berlin to beg the German Chancellor to help her get something past her own parliament that the European Union's commissioner and negotiator has already managed to get 27 separate sovereign governments to agree to. And still it continues. So you remember when I used to say to you, where will the blame go next? And again, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, look, if I have to eat a fat slice of humble pie at some point in proceedings over the next year or two, so be it, because I would love to be wrong about this. I used to joke, they're going to blame Lily Allen. Do you remember? Gary Lineker, J.K. Rowling. They're all going to get the blame. R Remainers. Who are you going to blame when your house catches fire. The people who told you that your house was going to catch fire or the people that told you your house could never catch fire because it was made of gold? Yep, going to blame the people that told me not to play with matches in the kitchen. I'm not going to blame the people who told me that my house would never burn down. Ah, oh, the madness. And now it's the Queen. You think I'm joking? I'm not. Andrew Lillico, um, who was a... a um, uh, an economist of sorts, uh, tied in inevitably with that group that the ERG appeal to whenever they're looking for some sort of um, cloak of plausibility. He has tweeted today about how this is the, the, the monarchy's fault. It's all the monarchy's fault. Suzanne Evans, again, this shrinking band of public figures, prominent individuals who cheer-led for Brexit for their entire lives, she's, she said it's spot on. The monarchy, they're blaming the Queen for the current mess. Because the only alternative is to blame themselves. It's why Oborn's contribution to the programme yesterday was so powerful when he just said, I, I am happy to accept, well, happy as in prepared, as opposed to ecstatic, that my economic, my analysis was wrong. The economic case for Brexit has completely, completely fallen to pieces. Which means that the delusion is now completely next level. Uh, that The idea, who are we going to blame now? Whose fault can it be? What is the alternative to turning around and saying sorry, like Peter Oborn did yesterday, and, and others have done, Oliver Norgrove, a former Vote Leave staffer, did it on this programme, plenty of others have done it, and I'm not talking about the people, uh, I'm not talking about mere voters like me, I'm talking about people who were prominent in the, in the Leave campaigns or integral to the Leave campaigns. They now have two choices, or well, three choices. They either carry on unicorning... God, I miss Kenneth Williams. They either carry on unicorning, which would involve pretending that no deal is going to be anything other than a catastrophe. No deal is the only way in which you can continue to claim that there, there are sunlit uplands around, just around the corner or, or, you know, have your cake and eat it. It's jam tomorrow. Uh, no deal, right? Or they can say, sorry, made a mistake, perhaps things could have gone differently, but they haven't. It would be an act of unconscionable national damage to carry on with this utterly unmandated lurch into oblivion. Or you've got option three, which is to say, it, it, I could have got away with it if it wasn't for you pesky kids. And that, of course, poses the question of which pesky kids? 
and now they've gone for the Queen. Um, I should tell you, it is April the 9th. Uh, as you know, it's National Unicorn Day. So happy National Unicorn Day. It is um, not as funny as it would have been once. But but here it is. Uh, you think I'm making this up. Here is um, Lilico, born in New Zealand, just like Daniel Hannan was born in Peru. Douglas Carswell grew up in Uganda. These men have a completely fantastical notion of what Britain was like. They got their idea of Britain during their childhood from, from Janet and John books and Enid Blyton, or Commando comics and Biggles. And, and, and that's somehow this mythical Albion to which they seek to return. So here he is now. If the monarchy cannot even intervene one way or another in a matter such as the Cooper Letwin bill, it is absurd to believe it could stand up against an elected communist or fascist parliament. Our monarchy has demonstrated itself no longer fit for purpose, alas. You know, actually, in 21st century realpolitik, the best safeguard against a European country electing a communist or fascist parliament is arguably the European Union. Have to wait and see how the situation with, with, with Hungary uh, continues. But, but as it stands, part of Jeremy Corbyn's reported antipathy towards the European Union is the fact that it would be... It would not necessarily prevent, but it would make it more difficult for them to introduce really, really far-reaching state aid and state ownership programs because the European Union would protect the rights of the people who currently own stuff, up to a point, as supranational laws. But there it is. Our monarchy has demonstrated itself no longer fit for purpose. I would love to take calls from you if you're a Brexiter and you blame the Queen. 0345 6060 973. How is it the Queen's fault? Just explain this one to me. Because I quite like... I quite like her. I sue me, you know. I'm not necessarily abandoning all of my Republican tendencies. I suspect the pendulum is going to swing fairly violently when Prince Charles gets the gig. But right now, if you can explain to me how this is all the Queen's fault, I will give you the money myself. If you are the Queen, probably going to get a Rayleigh Otter. 0345 973 How is this your fault, Your Majesty? Because Andrew Lillico thinks so, and Suzanne Evans, formerly of UKIP, she thinks that that is, and I quote, spot on. It's the Queen's fault. I'd love to track that trail. Where did it begin? Well, when it, beca when it began to become clear that things were going wrong, because uh, we had about a year of you lost, get over it. Do you remember? You lost, get over it. And you sort of go, well, all right, what did you win again? The referendum. Yeah, but what was the actual prize? The prize can't be the process. The process can't be the prize. Oh, I wish I'd said that sooner. The process can't be the prize. So you won the process. What's the prize? There is no prize. It's an empty box. It's an empty box with a beautiful picture on it. You believed that the box would contain what was depicted in the beautiful picture. I get that. There's no shame in that. But it's empty. We know that now. So who are you going to blame for the fact that it's empty? The Queen, apparently. Holy maloli. That's just unbelievable. And yet, with Brexit, I'm not sure unbelievable is even a word anymore. 11 minutes after 12. What angle are we going to take? Um, uh, have I had any calls yet explaining why it's the Queen's fault? I can't sit here till 1 o'clock, can we? Why, why not? There's phone lines free. We never have free phone lines when we're discussing Brexit. But I'm just going to give myself another minute to see if anyone wants to ring in and tell me why they blame the Queen as well. 0345 60 I'm an ardent royalist and love our royal family, but this is spot on. Bitterly disappointed. What's spot on again, Suzanne Evans? Our monarchy has demonstrated itself no longer fit for purpose, alas, says Andrew Lillico. Anyone? Anyone? Going to blame the Queen? Because you followed these guys into the lobby, remember, into the voting booths. They, they are, you own them. They own you. These are the people you believed. Now they're blaming the Queen. Because the alternative would be for you to blame them. I will never abandon the DUP, said Jacob Rees-Mogg 24 hours before abandoning the DUP. Slavery is how he described the withdrawal agreement that he would never vote for because he would never abandon the DUP, but which he voted for 24 hours after saying he would never abandon the DUP and having subsequently previously described it as slavery. What are you going to blame next? The Queen? To be fair to the J-Dog, I don't think he'd ever stoop that low, would he? Apparently he used to stand up for the national anthem when he was at school, when it comes on at the end of the shipping forecast on a different radio station. 
or it used to, I don't know if it still does actually, never up that late anymore. He used to stand up, he'd get out of bed in his double-breasted pyjamas and stand up for the national anthem. So he must be outraged to see the chairman of the group of economists who are the only economists on the planet to offer support to his enthusiasm for no-deal Brexit standing up and said that the monarchy is no longer fit for purpose. In fact, I think we should interrupt the programme when Jacob Rees-Mogg's response to this is, is made. He is going to be spitting nails. Seriously, the J-Dog is going to go wild when he finds out that Lilico has dissed the Queen. Because you can say what you like about Jacob Rees-Mogg, he's a proper patriot. Slagging off the Queen, man. That's dark. No one? Have we got one? Cool. Well, seriously, in good faith, it's all the Queen's fault. Or is it some... Or is he joking? Is it a genuine call? Let's talk to him. Get him on, quick. Let's go. Phil, in Cambridge. Why are we blaming oh, yeah, the Queen? Yeah. I, 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 I'm going to be quite cautious about what I say, so I don't want to get shot. Um, but I, I, I would like to say that the Queen, I would have hoped, could have walked into Parliament a lot sooner than what, you know, uh, from the involvement perspective, and rattled a few cages. Why, why couldn't she have walked in between the Conservatives and Labour Parliament and said, look, you know, you two need to get your heads together because you're making us look like a mockery? Well, because she's politically neutral. OK, but... It's, 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 it's a reflection on, on our country. It's, it's, you know, you, you talk to people abroad... But it's, and, been, and, it's not hard. I mean, it's a tragedy that's been visited upon the country by the Brexit campaigners, but it, the Queen can't get involved. She has to be neutral. Well, OK, but, but, but from the outside looking in, I would have thought that, you know, with her having a, a, a higher state within, within the country... But, it, I mean, that's the opposite have... of democracy as well, and, and all, all those shysters kept banging on about democracy, didn't they, and taking back control. You can't, you can't take back control and then say, we should let the unelected monarch do stuff. No, no. But, but, Are you but, sure you've it... thought this through, Phil, before ringing in? <laughs> I appreciate it was a lot easier to get on air than it would be ordinarily, but I, I don't think anyone's fallen apart quite so quickly in all the years that I've been doing this. <laughs> I've, I've been sat amongst friends and we, 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 had, a, we had a conversation regarding um, the Queen and, and, yes. and what we thought, you know, she, she could have taken on by now. And I'm not saying she should have walked in and said, right, this is decisions that need to be made. But I thought that she could have quite easily have got in there and said, look, you know, you guys, I can't believe, haven't sat around a table and sorted this one out. But, but it can't be sorted out. That's the only thing that we've learned for certain over the last three mm. years. It's an undeliverable promise, mate. Even the mm. Queen, is, can't, she can't wave her magic wand or, 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 or her scepter and make no. unicorns appear or, or create a cake, as Boris Johnson described it, that we'd be able to simultaneously have and eat. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. I'm not. I'm not going. I'm not going to monster you because uh, it was a fair crack of the way. It wasn't actually. It was pathetic, but in a nice way. So we'll part as friends. And that's about as good as it gets, presumably. If you are going to try and claim that this is all the Queen's fault, the monarchy is is uh, mind boggles, genuinely boggles. So we won't talk about the Queen. We'll talk about Jeremy Corbyn. I want you to call me if you're a big fan of Jeremy Corbyn's. I know that we, we, we don't have a lot of common ground on, on that particular issue. We can have common ground on policies and our desire for what we want the country to perhaps look like or a bit more like in the future. But on, on, on that, I mean, the Sunday Times splash about anti-Semitism was utterly, utterly horrifying this Sunday. In the interest of balance, Conservatives are finally taking some action under enormous duress to address the rancid and rampant Islamophobia in their ranks. But it doesn't reach up to Theresa May, oddly, whereas an awful lot of people feel in the Sunday Times report on Sunday certainly suggested that if, a, if not a blind eye being turned, then certainly a, a, a different standard being applied to anti-Semitism um, than would be applied to other uh, bigotries and, and prejudices. But Jeremy Corbyn, back in there again today, right? If they cobble together withdrawal agreement plus customs union this is this is friday now the wheels come off this is one chance left i think for theresa may if they do it and corbyn supports it in parliament and enough mps go with him to get it through without a second referendum without a people's vote there's a little rally for the people's vote this afternoon um, I'm afraid I don't know the details, but I will be appearing on the stage. <laughs> um, how would you feel? So, so hardcore Corbyn supporters, how will you feel if he is the instrument of Brexit without reference back to the electorate? 
because in the context of democracy, and I would think in the context of Labour Party policy and the expressed wishes of the Labour Party membership, the idea of Corbyn helping Theresa May to get Brexit through Parliament without a second referendum is almost as bonkers as trying to blame it on the Queen. But now that we know the latter has happened, I wouldn't put money on the former not happening. Well, Jeremy Corbyn, we've done this with Theresa May about a dozen times, but we haven't done it with Jeremy Corbyn, and, and it does appear that he is, well, I mean, who knows what's going on? Are they really conducting negotiations that aren't achieving anything but carrying on endlessly? It's possible, or is there light at the end of the tunnel? If there is light at the end of the tunnel, then you should know that the Conservative Party issued internal instructions yesterday to prepare to put candidates up in the European elections, the looming European elections. Jeremy Corbyn, what we don't know, of course, is what they've meant all along by close alignment with the single market. That seems to be fairly meaningless. We know what customs union is. We know that it would... Um, I, I mean, you don't even want to use the word prevent. This notional uh, freedom to negotiate our own trade agreements that would be almost by definition inferior to the ones we currently have. We might possibly be able to move a little quicker with markets that the European Union doesn't currently have trade agreements with. But the idea that we'd be able to secure terms and conditions that were preferable to the ones the European Union could, could secure is daft. I mean, it's utterly, utterly stupid. But it's also impossible if we're in a customs union. So it renders something ridiculous impossible. In the context of Brexit, that will be greeted as bad news. Jeremy Corbyn might be the... I choose my words a little bit carefully. My, my, I don't want to talk about greasing the passage of the bill through Parliament. That's a bit icky. I, I, he might be the... What's the word I'm looking for? The catalyst. Jeremy Corbyn might be the difference. She can't get it through Parliament with the support of her own people, so she could get it through Parliament with the support of Jeremy Corbyn and his people if they add customs union to the withdrawal agreement. The semantics have been fascinating. The, the uh, key lieutenants in the Labour movement very reluctant to commit to a second referendum. A lot of the senior Labour figures, including Emily Thornberry, who did this publicly, which means I think that she does fear Corbyn might sign off on it without putting it to the people. That, that's the prospect we're examining. If Jeremy Corbyn were to seek to help Theresa May to get Brexit through Parliament without a second referendum, how would you feel? And then we can expand it into the thing we've done with or for Theresa May many, many times, which is this. Number one, what do you think he is up to? Number two, what do you think he should be doing? And number three, what do you think he will do? So what's he up to? What should he be doing? What, in your opinion, and what do you think he will do? And I'll take anything you've got on all three of those questions. Let's start in Southampton with Alan. Alan, what would you like to say? Hello. Yeah, basically, I think, you know, we've done as much negotiating as we can. I think we need to um, revoke Article 50 now and put it to the people for a second referendum. And I make that point because um, I think at the start of, um, the, you know, the campaign to leave um, the EU... We had the £350 million for the um, NHS thing. That was a lie. And then Theresa May comes along and we get, oh, I'm going to be... I think we're doing a bit of a touch of the rear view mirrors on this one, Alan. You know that you're not going to get any disagreement from me. But what, what, yeah. what about the specific Jeremy Corbyn question? I think with Jeremy Corbyn, you know, I, I, I don't think, you know, I see it as him saving it. And I think that he should be pushing for a, a second referendum. I think he... It, he, you know, all right, yeah, he's not, he's not a Remainer, you know, he, he's made that clear over the years, you know, he's against the EU, but I think he needs to do what's in the public interest and not what's in his interest. What about the constituents in Labour seats that voted for leave and still, and, and it, I, I mean, I, I don't think this is intellectually sustainable, but emotionally they still feel that leave is 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 what they want, even though yeah, what they were told it would so, involve bears you know, no resemblance feel, at all to what is like going to happen. It, it, it's public deception by the Conservative Party, and I don't think their hearts are in it right now. I don't think they're going to agree because there's too many people positioning themselves for after Theresa May for, for the leadership contest. We're seeing, you're already seeing comments from Boris and Jason Rees-Mogg the last couple of days. I think it's more about positioning themselves for, you know, so you think he should contest. throw his weight behind a people's vote? <coughs> uh, if, if it's an option, we could still crash out with no deal on Friday, of course, legally, as things stand. Absolutely. What, what, what do you think he will do? 
when you talk about self-interest versus national interest? I've got a feeling that he will try and, 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 and come up with a deal. And, yeah, I do and, as well. And, and save her, to be honest. I do as well. Why would he yeah. do that? Because he's been a lever all his life. Yeah. And the question of what about this absolute boy, this messiah that was supposed to build his policy entirely upon the wishes of the membership, oh, that was that was then and this is now. Yeah, see, I didn't get a vote because, um, the, you know, obviously circumstance, I, I, I wasn't allowed to vote because the idea of me getting a vote made Cameron feel physically sick. Where are you from? Um, I was in prison at the time, so I couldn't oh, vote. Enough. But, yes. you know... He did say it made him feel physically sick as well. And, yeah. and, and given the conversation we had in the last hour, that's a, a particularly... a long list of fairly repellent things. Uh, again, was, was, was one of them. The reason why people are in favour of prisoners having votes is because governments, in a theoretical future and in an actual existing past, lock up political opponents. So, you know, let's have a look at Turkey at the moment. <laughs> And you'll have a clear idea of why on an international scale, uh, support for prisoners to have votes is, is not the cut and dried issue that many people consider it to be. Um, I suppose if it's any consolation, Alan, it wouldn't have made any difference on the day. John's in Lewis. John, Jeremy Corbyn, what, what, what should he do? What do you think he will do? And what do you think he's currently up to? OK, can I just uh, try to talk to him about Barnet a little while ago, so you're my second choice this morning. OK. Sorry about that. That's all right. But, um, yeah, I think whatever he does, whether he uh, agrees a deal or not with Theresa May, it's got to be attached to a referendum. But, uh, for two reasons, it's the right thing to do. Do you know what, country. mate? I'm I'm I, I'm going to go with the other person you mentioned and, and and conclude that you're not you're not of a sufficiently high caliber to to, to be on air. Oh, why is that? It's just boring. Oh, okay, fair enough. 28 minutes after 12, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we will attempt to rejig our uh, uh, our feeder system and return to the question after the break of what you think Jeremy Corbyn is up to. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three what you think he should do in the current context and that's the fascinating question absolutely fascinating question because i i can't quite see how you could combine unless you are a lexiter and and that is a an existing constituency but i can't quite see how you would combine continuing support for jeremy corbyn continuing faith in his uh unique skill set with a desire to stay in the European Union. If he, if he doesn't deliver on this, or if he allows Theresa May to squeak through without putting it back to the people or without having a second referendum, then how do you feel about him? That, that's what I really want to get to the nub of. And, and I need to avoid saying, I told you you shouldn't have trusted him, because I, I don't want to go down that road. I want to know how you personally compute or calculate that particular dilemma. Jeremy Corbyn has not won my support um, on a personal level. That's irrelevant. He won yours. But you also feel that leaving the European Union would be disastrous. If Jeremy Corbyn turns out to be the means with which Theresa May is able to deliver Brexit, just, just theoretically, and I promise you there's no recriminations or, 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 or sententiousness here from me, I'm just fascinated to know which way you would go. What would, what would triumph in those priorities. You want two things. You want Jeremy Corbyn, but you also want to stop Brexit. If Jeremy Corbyn makes stopping Brexit impossible, how do you feel about him? 0345 6060 973. Do you want to know something funny? The number of people, I've spent years, oh, well, not, is it years? Probably is. The, the Ray Otter Award that we reserve for the most um, pertinent contributors to the programme. Why would I have called it a Rally Otter? Like as in Rally Bicycles. And then otter, as in the waterborne mammal. So many people get in touch when, when we actually write down the words Ray Leota, the star of Goodfellas, and more importantly for this particular episode um, of Field of Dreams. And so you, you've heard me saying for a year, oh, we're going to give you a Rally Otter or a Ray Leota. And you think, oh, why is it called? What, why would that even be a thing? Why haven't you got in touch with me in the past? I said, what, why, what do you mean, Ray Le And then I could... Uh, anyway, and it's... Missed you two days away. Uh, Mark's in Swindon. Corbyn, uh, what do you want to say, Mark? What should he do? What will he do? How would you feel if, if it comes down to a straight choice between continuing to support Jeremy Corbyn and ceasing your support for trying to stop Brexit? Well, I find the whole thing just heartbreaking for me because um, when 
I voted for Jeremy Corbyn and I became a Labour member. I met him and he's the only political leader I ever wanted to meet. Yes. And what about Gandhi? All the stuff that's going on now uh, that he seems to be supporting the Tory government, it just breaks my heart because in where I live in Sweden, it's one of those indicative consistencies where you can see where the, the, the election's going to go. Yes. This one second, and I'm always trying to call me at the same time. And, and so if we, if we don't vote Labour in this town, we get a Conservative government, and I don't want that, but I don't want to leave. And I, won't, I can't vote for a, a party of... They've um, broken Corbyn everything, haven't they? They've broken everything. Yeah. Do you have any sympathy for Corbyn's... There was a phrase doing the rounds in the middle of last year that you don't interrupt your enemy when they're making a terrible mistake, but I would have always argued that if that terrible mistake is going to damage the very fabric of our nation, then then sitting on your hands probably isn't helpful. He's not sitting on his hands now, but I still couldn't tell you what is in his heart of hearts on this issue. Do you think we should really know by now, or can you see any wisdom in his reticence? Yeah, I think, I think he needs to come out now, because, you know, people used to say along those lines, oh, he's playing the long game. He's letting the Conservatives beat themselves up. But it, to get into bed with them, it's, it's distasteful. It's... It's horrible. And as a Labour Party voter for all my life, it's like I say, it's just, just heartbreaking. It could happen, and I can't see a way out of it without a change of leadership. And he's got such a massive following. If you if you say anything against Jeremy Corbyn on any any social media, you just get attacked. You think you think you get attacked, mate? You should yeah. you should walk a mile in my Twitter shoes if they're <laughs> if they're <laughs> even a thing. It's, it is. I mean, it's it's virulent. Okay, so some question marks over how much of it is real people and how much of it is not. But that applies to to all sort of hate mobs on Twitter, not just the Jeremy Corbyn supporting ones. So. So, I, I mean, I mean th this is a big issue. Uh, you could look at your individual MP, but for many people, of course, it doesn't matter how you vote in your constituency, your individual MP doesn't have a chance of winning. I'm lucky in that I can vote for my local Labour MP, should I so desire, um, confident that she's in with a fair crack of the whip of getting into the House of Commons, but I'd be voting Labour despite Corbyn. You want to vote Labour because of Corbyn, but if he... If he delivers Brexit, Theresa May's watered-down, diluted, dismal Brexit, I, I mean, it's hard to know who you'd ever vote for again. Mm. I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to vote Green, because I quite like Caroline Lucas. Um, but they haven't got a chance in this town. Well, that, actually, well, that, that, yeah, but they was... never will have, as long as people like you and me think like we both think, Mark. And, and I, I, I hope, you know, the fact that I put myself in the same category insulates me from any accusations of, of being rude to you. Because it happened in Brighton. I know Brighton is a unique constituency, but it did happen there. So I always think there was a great advert for a trade union many years ago. And it, it was insects. I think it was ants. And they needed to move something. And obviously one ant on their own can't move it. But thousands and thousands of ants can. And that's the power of trade unions, the power of collective bargaining. Something similar always pops up in the back of my brain when we talk about, well, I couldn't vote for them because they'd never win. Charlie's in Islington. Charlie, how appropriate. You're in Jeremy Corbyn uh, country. What would you like to say? Uh, I don't know. It feels obvious to me, but maybe it's, maybe it's not as simple as I think it is. But what Jeremy seems to want is nothing to do with Brexit. It's really power. Yes. He, he's got lots of ideas. He got, there's lots of things he wants to implement from nationalizing various industries. He's clearly got a passion for the poorest in society who he wants to help. And he can't do that from the opposition benches. He wants to be in power. Brexit seems to be like a little bit of a stumbling block on the way. He would, as he's been very clear in historic speeches, uh, stated he wants to leave Europe, but he can do some of the things he wants to do. He can't nationalize various in industries, subsidize various things without leaving the European Union. So that's what he wants. But he, can, he can, but he thinks he can't. I know that's a slightly odd wriggle to introduce to proceedings at the moment. And there would be some things that he'd, he'd struggle to do, but they're not necessarily things that are currently on his wish list. He has a very 1970s view of the... Well, he has a very 1970s view of everything. But... Uh, I'd love for you to have him on the show. So well, he you and me both have been why, asking for why? three years, mate. Uh, good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't but know why that gonna, is. What, well, I mean, you're... you're no, I don't, let's not talk about me. I want to talk about him. So, so if, if he did do the, the deal... Which I think he would. I think with the withdrawal agreement plus customs union, if he thought he could get that through Parliament with um, 
without going to the people, I think he would current, personally, very personal position, I think he would do that. And so, I think... So I agree with you, that's what he wants, but yes. will he get it? Because he needs to show to MPs, that even if it's just a, what's the word, lip service, to show them, I'm trying to get you a referendum, I'm trying to get you a people's yeah. vote. What's he going to do? I think he'll cut a deal, this is what... I'd love to be a fly on the wall in this room in the meeting with him and Theresa May. In my head, it's been something like this. Neither of us want a people's vote, but we have to make it look like we're making an effort here. Yes. So let's give it back to MPs, but make sure that MPs vote it down. I don't know how they're going to do that, but that's how it's going to work in Germany. So some today, some sort of washing of hands, like a Pontius Pilate of politics sort of attempt to, to, to be responsible for things, but take no responsibility for them. We tried... But it wasn't us that shot it down, it was the MP. What we're doing now, isn't it, is that everyone is casting around for, the, for, for, for blame. Um, on the Remain side, it's really easy to do. You blame the people who've turned out to have been wrong. Not necessarily deceitful or evil or any of those things, although the decent people got into bed with evil people to get Brexit over the line. The minute that Breaking Point poster was unveiled should have been the minute that all right-thinking, decent people with leanings towards Brexit disassociated themselves from the campaign this time and, and dedicated themselves to trying to do it again at some point in the future where, where they didn't have to ride the tiger of vile, vile race baiting. But we are where we are. So, so you look at the personnel now. Remainers know who to blame. Leavers can't really blame Remainers anymore unless you really are suspending reality. Blaming the Queen, that's popular this morning. A couple of key players on the leave side having a crack at blaming the Queen. Who else are you going to blame? Theresa May, I think, is seeking to put some of the blame for the inadequacies of whatever Brexit deal she can get through Parliament on Jeremy Corbyn. That's why they called it a trap when she first announced it. But Jeremy Corbyn won't necessarily see it as a trap if it lets him inherit Downing Street with Brexit, however inadequate and unsatisfying it is, a fait accompli. And that would necessitate bypassing the people who probably would vote next time to remain. Uh, of course, then we refer back to that Tory MP yesterday, Gary Streeter, who said he wants to vote for the withdrawal agreement precisely because he thinks that if there was a second referendum, it would go the, f go the way of Remain. And there is, in a nutshell, the definition of undemocratic. Oh, no, I wouldn't want to put it to the people because they might do the thing I don't want. Mark's in Norwich. Mark, what do you think? Mark? I can tell the phone line went a bit... Can you yeah, hear I, anything? I, I can hear you now. I don't know what happened there, Mark. What would you like to say? I had you on mute, but I forgot to take you on. It's all happening um, today. Bigging up yeah, the opposition, yeah. sticking me on mute. <laughs> this is outrageous. <laughs> Ca carry I'm on, mate. To, Go on. Um, I would be disappointed if uh, Jeremy didn't bring it back to the people. Uh, when Brexit first occurred, I felt we lost... Uh, I remember Remainer. We lost the stack Democratic, but with everything that came out, I felt, no, we definitely need a people's vote. I'm not particularly aware. It's only come about in the last three years. Um, but I feel it's the right thing to bring o it On a to scale of one to ten, how yeah. would you describe your admiration of, affection for, support for Jeremy Corbyn? Um, my political awareness came about because of Jeremy Corbyn. So you're a big fan. Um, you're one of the, one of the, 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 the kind of tidal wave of, of support that yes, came as a consequence yeah. of his emergence and his leadership, which, which yeah. uh, you know, even if you haven't been unimpressed by him subsequently, that's a beautiful thing, that, that notion of politicising and, and engaging people who hadn't previously been politicised. So now I'm putting them on the scales. Here's your yeah. support for Jeremy Corbyn. Here's your desire not to leave the European Union. How do you psychologically process the possibility, because that's all it is, I could have got this horribly wrong, that Jeremy yeah. Corbyn delivers Brexit. If he becomes the the means through which Theresa May gets this dismal withdrawal agreement over the line, how, how do you square your support for Jeremy Corbyn? Do you know yet? Yeah, I, I would be disappointed, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, but how it. disappointed? But, I want numbers, uh, I, I want measures. Uh, do you know what, James, I'd put it for, uh, six or seven. And the reason why is because um, it's not about Brexit. There's a lot yeah. of stuff going on besides Brexit. For sure. Now, I live in Norwich, I'm from London originally, and I'm, I'm okay. Um, but a lot of my family didn't even know anything about Brexit. No. Um, it was me speaking to them and telling them, look, we, you need to wake up. This is happening to our country. We live in it. But where I come from originally, people think that the government um, don't do anything for them. So what's the point? Well, they of don't, do they? I mean, they don't, yeah, that's no, the, exactly. one of the great sort of hardy perennials of Brexit. People voted to leave the European Union because they don't feel their own government has done anything for them. They're right yeah. that their own government yeah. hasn't, especially since 2010. 
but they're wrong to think that's got anything to do with European Union membership. It was another thing, another clever, uh, I I irreconcilable promise that was made to people. And what do you think he, he is going to do? Problems. What do you think he is going to do, briefly? I, f I felt beforehand that he would... Well, now I think... He, for ages, he's been very vague on Brexit. But in the last couple of weeks, he has been mentioning the people's vote. So I'm hoping... Um, <laughs> hoping very hard that at the end of the process he will attack whatever May comes with or whatever deal they make with the people's With a referendum, I, yeah. I am as well, but yeah. I, I just, I think Emily Thornberry's public intervention on the question was really pertinent because she's closer to the high command than many, but um, I, it didn't feel that that was a foregone conclusion. So to publicly insist upon it or call for it suggests that there was a very strong possibility in her mind that Corbyn wouldn't deliver it. Should we catch up with Theo a little bit? I don't know what's happened while we've been on air. Um, Theo will. He'll tell you after this. And we, we're doing that thing that, that we sometimes do, but it's, it, it, it demands a, probably a little bit more effort on your part than it does on mine, which is a sort of multiple-choice Brexit-based question. In this case, with regard to Jeremy Corbyn, what do you think he is up to? What would you like him to do? And what do you think he will do? And it's a mark of Brexit that those three questions could accommodate. They could all admit profoundly different answers. The same thing happens when we talk about Theresa May. What do you think she's up to? What do you think she should do? What do you think she will do? Again, three perfectly um, possible answers to that question that are all completely different from each other. And, and that will um, detain us for a little longer before Theo Oshawa treats us to whatever pearls of wisdom he's managed to cough up today. John's in Froome. John, what would you like to say? Well, uh, good afternoon, James. Hello, John. Um, well, in answer to your question in the order, um, I think Jeremy Corbyn is a lifelong Eurosceptic. I yeah. think he's looking to get a deal that will take us out of the EU yeah. um, without a deal. Uh, sorry, without a people's vote. Yeah. And I so think I. that's... We could be wrong. I hope we're wrong, but well, that's, that's hope, what I'm I seeing in my tea leaves. I think that's contrary to Labour Party policy that was passed at conference back in September because that did include the option of a people's vote. Yeah. I think if he were to go down that route, he would see a lot of people within the Labour Party, and I'm one. I'm a long-standing Labour Party member. I'm on the left of the party, although not necessarily a Corbyn Easter. I understand. Um, but if that were to happen, if, if, if we were to agree that deal without a people's vote, then I would leave the Labour Party. Would you um, really? And I would be, I would be politically homeless. This Ooh. Brexit to me is the issue of my lifetime and the future of my kids and my potential grandkids is, is in the balance here. And for a Labour leader that purports to be the man of the people, not to take that into account, I think is unforgivable and I would leave the Labour Party on that you, basis, James. I, I, you know, I'm so glad you're here today because I, I, I don't know why. I started this year but, but determined to be a bit more equable. Uh, not not changing my position on Brexit or anything like that, but it, it means I've, I've I've held back a bit from really strong statements, and I'm glad I have because it adds more power to you when you make one like that. I think you're right, mate. I think as a lifelong Labour member, you 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 couldn't continue to support a party that had taken us out of an internationalist, cooperative, supranational organisation dedicated to protecting workers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, and I, you know, again, this, it purports to lead the Labour Party. You know, I get the Labour Party done like most parties in this country. They, they mm. do have democratic um, structures within that. And, and conference um, is the ultimate parliament of the Labour Party. And if you were to go against that, then what does that say, to, to say about him as a Democrat? I, 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 um, I'm, yeah. always, You're on I'm always of the view that leaders lead. And if the Brexit decision was wrong, and I believe it was because I'm an archery man, I was on the, the, on the march a couple of weeks ago, um, a leader's job is to lead. And if it's to say that this is the wrong decision, he believes it's the wrong decision that yeah. the British people made, then he's got to say that. He's got to be honest about that. Uh, that that's and, what and, leading is. Leading is not. Absolutely. Is I mean, in the immediate aftermath of the referendum result, we were waiting to see how things shook down. You could have got away with saying will of the people or, 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 or some, some such. It only became fatuous when it became clear that they were the irreconcilable wills of a hugely disparate group of people. Anyone who says 70... I think I heard... What's his chops? The bloke who's made out of mince. Marc Francois. I think I heard Marc Francois say something the other day about um, I speak for the 17.4 million people. And you just think, mate, a crikey. 
get on with it. No, nobody speaks for 17.4 million people, not least because a significant swathe of that number have already changed their mind completely, let alone recognise that they voted alongside people who voted for a completely different, irreconcilable Brexit. Speaking of irreconcilable, thank you, John. I really enjoyed that, and I, 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 the sincerity was palpable in your contribution. Um, if only we could say the same about Theo Washwood. He's here to now to talk us through the latest. Well, well, what's happened, Theo? I've been over at the Boo Bruges Group, not the Bruges Group, the Bruges Group yes. in Westminster, uh, which is a uh, right-wing Euroskeptic. Uh, they were like the seeds, weren't they? The little acorns of Euroscepticism. The Bruges Group were for, you know, the, the, almost the civilised days before the ERG came into yes. existence and uh, fetishised ignorance. So they're on the outside of the Conservative uh, Party, uh, but they count um, the late... Uh, Lady Thatcher uh, as their president um, and uh, their director is Barry Legg and in front of an audience of around 70 uh, members and three serving Conservative MPs he gave this speech and if you listen carefully James you will hear calls uh, for the Prime Minister to or the Prime Minister described uh, and heckled as a traitor. It's the crisis of our lifetime. The gap between the governed and the governors has never been wider. Yeah, yeah. And now is the moment of truth. Mrs. May's deal is not a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a European. The truth is that there has been no real <coughs> negotiations. Yeah, yes. Yes. M Mrs. May's deal is really a declaration of unconditional surrender. Yes. I, I'm going to let you off on this occasion because we're friends. But you're the political editor of LBC. You're supposed to come here and play us some politics, not just old. I've got some politics. I don't want to hear old episodes of League of Gentlemen. <laughs> I've got some politics for you, James. I've got the latest local politics for local people. I've got some politics. I've got <laughs> the latest. Stop it. I've, <laughs> I've got the latest Mark Francois war story. Oh, I paid a visit to the headquarters of the intelligence corps at Chicksands in Bedfordshire. As part of my visit, I was introduced to a number of junior NCOs who had just finished what the Inc. Corps called a basic intelligence course. And I was chatting to one of these corporals, and I said to him, tell me, corporal, what was the final exercise at the end of your course? And at this point, he looked slightly nervous, and I saw sideways glances starting to be exchanged. So I thought, I'm onto something here. So I put on my old platoon commander voice, and I said more sternly, corporal, what was your final exercise? And the chap braced up. And with the moral courage of the British junior NCO down the centuries, when talking to authorities, he said the following. Well, sir, as you asked, he said the scenario we were given was that you, Minayet, were visiting a police station in the West Midlands, and we received a credible intelligence tip that there was a threat to your life. So our syndicate's mission was to provide intelligence and security advice to the West Midlands Constabulary to protect you for the duration of your visit. And after the planning phase, we ran an exercise to test it. Oh, I said, what happened? You got killed, sir. <laughs> What's he talking about? He's talking about when he went to Chick Chickford Sands in Bedfordshire and he met the Intelligence Corps, and of course, because he was a member of the army, former soldier, former veteran, yeah. territorial army, then they stood up to his authority. Right. Why would he have a platoon commander's voice? He's made out of mints. Well, he, he was a former platoon commander on wet weekends. I, do you know, <laughs> I, I, I thought when Andrew Lillico tried to blame it all on the Queen, I thought today had peaked. No, well, that's my job. I'm, that's my job is to, to peak whatever you peak for, <laughs> James. <laughs> it's just twin peaks. <laughs> Theo Ashwood, the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, what are we going to do when it's all over? Right? I don't, don't, know, don't go, don't no, know. stop it now. It's existential. We'll, that's ha it from... we'll have to go on one of those official military debriefings. <laughs> yeah, we Maybe with Mark Francois. There. Will you yeah. put on your platoon commander's voice? Uh, I certainly will. <laughs> Carry on, sir. Uh, that's it for another uh, day. Back tomorrow at 10. Uh, Thank you, Theo. Here's Shane of Focus.